it's very hard dealing with an asset, let's say crypto, that is very volatile, but when it runs, it really runs. And, and you become overwhelmed by emotion. FOMO, you see your friends bought that 100x dog coin and you're like, I want some of that. You want to look for 100x's as opposed to just own some Bitcoin. And if you want to own some ETH and if, you know, a few of the big projects and just buy and hold. But people don't do it. They want to start trading it because they think they can make more money. Everybody wants price targets. And then a year and a half's time, they hate you for it because you weren't exactly right. I think as assets mature, they become less volatile. <clears throat> so I think we need to expect that. And particularly from passive flows of 401k investors putting it in every two weeks, every month, that'll keep a bid that didn't exist before. Um, so I think, yes, we'll probably see lower volatility, but we'll also be feeding capital into crypto land. And crypto land's not just the state of Bitcoin, it's a whole bunch of other places that are going to see capital flows. So the, the Wild West will still exist, but the big daddy becomes less volatile, which it, yes, it's a shame because we can't make as much money out of each cycle. But if our underlying philosophy is we want the adoption of this technology to be broad and deep, it has to go that way. So it's kind of good from that philosophical angle of trying to change the world, bad from the the ridiculousness of the cycles and how profitable they can be if you get them right. Yeah, so what you've done, and it was always going to happen, is Bitcoin's now become financialized. When it wasn't really, it was still had purity to it. Now, it doesn't mean it's impure because of this, but you've allowed a financialization layer. And what that's going to mean is that they are going to offer leveraged products on it. Now, options are, are kind of defined risk products. But what you end up with is in a very high volatility product, we get a lot of volatility sellers. And it dampens the market because they're always hedging. And that hedging structure um, can really change the nature of market. Sometimes it creates acceleration points because everybody's short and suddenly the price goes through and everyone has to buy everything back. Other times, just by the ongoing selling of yield, you know, selling a premium for yield, uh, it slows down the whole market itself. Um, so I do think that's a bigger deal than people expect. Um, but the casino for options on ETFs is going to be quite amusing for a while as well. Because, you know, if you think about how many, how much the Robin Hood crowd use options on uh, tech stocks, I think they're going to go wild on this stuff. And they've not been able to, you know, for Americans, it was really hard. You know, Deribit was not accessible to Americans. They're now going to start using options. Well, I don't know when that launches, but it'll happen at some point. And that brings in all the market making firms and the investment banks and all of these other financial players. So this is the difficulty people have with um, different time horizons. So interest rates are set by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve operates in core inflation land, which is driven by um, core inflation and unemployment, which is driven by stuff like owner equivalent rents and stuff. All of this stuff is lagged. So the Fed operate in that, but lags. Stuff like crypto and tech stocks are trading on liquidity and future liquidity. So financial conditions, they eased a long time ago. So people looking at the Fed saying, well, when the Fed raise or when the Fed cut, that's not relevant. What's actually relevant is what the kind of financial conditions are doing, which have been loosening massively and liquidity has been rising. Whether you use Fed net liquidity or broader measures or M2, they're all rising on a global basis. And the global basis is another key thing most people miss because they kind of look at the US only. But, you know, if, I, if we look at this cycle, who's got the biggest economic problems right now is China. So they probably have the biggest bazooka to fire to try and get their economy going. Then it's probably the Europeans, then the US. You know, it feels that way. But we've seen liquidity. You know, I managed to catch the bottom in crypto and tech last year because of liquidity had bottomed. And the moment it bottomed, ETH bottomed first, and then the whole space bottomed, including tech, in October. Um, and it's just been following that liquidity cycle ever since. And using my forward-looking projections based around this everything code thesis, you know, it should continue all the way into 2025. 
um, and crypto should continue to price that. Look, you've been around this for a long time. We've all made the mistakes and everybody makes mistakes. It's very hard dealing with an asset, let's say crypto, that is very volatile, but when it runs, it really runs. And, and you become overwhelmed by emotion. FOMO, you see your friends bought that 100x dog coin and you're like, I want some of that. You want to look for 100x's as opposed to just own some Bitcoin. And if you want to own some ETH and if you know a few of the big projects and just buy and hold. But people don't do it. They want to start trading it because they think they can make more money. Um, also, they custody things wrong. People start thinking, oh, I want the extra 5% yield by sticking into some project of which they know nothing about the security of. And the don't fuck this up is don't let somebody take your tokens. Don't trade and hold quality assets. If you can do that with 90% of your portfolio, you will do well. Keep 10% to be a total filthy degen. Do what the hell you want, because that will go to zero. We've all got the wallet of shame, right? Every single one of us has a wallet of shame of shrapnel left from the previous cycle that didn't do anything. So don't fuck it up. Is trying to protect people from themselves. And so we've actually even issued an NFT, which is free. So it's in your wallet and it's a video of me saying, don't fuck this up. So when people go in their wallets, there's me looking at them disapprovingly, trying to say, look, don't fuck this up. I don't know is the answer for the same reason. Also, everybody's got PTSD because of last time, right? That second run up after the big correction, the second run up, everybody thought it was gonna extend further and it didn't. And so everyone's got PTSD. So how I'm thinking about it, I'm giving a 60% probability this is a relatively normal cycle, in which case it would get to 150,000, let's say. I'm giving a 20% chance that it's actually a front-loaded cycle because of the ETF and other stuff that maybe it gets to that 150 faster and then fades, which will be kind of pain for a lot of people who expect it to go into 2025, right? And then the other 20% chance, I think, is that this ends up being a bubble cycle. And so it looks more like 2011, 12, 13 than it does the previous one. And in which case, if you remember that cycle, it had an interim top correction. Everyone thought it was over and then it just exploded again. I think there's a decent chance of that. But we need to see the, the con contextualization of how the ETF flows impact you know, what's happening with monetary policy, what's going on in the economy, how the, how the election is going to play into this. So that's how I'm thinking of it. That upside crazy bubble target, you know, using that kind of everything code structure that, you know, I've talked about in the past, you know, we get price targets of half a million plus. So even if I discount me for being a moron by 50%, you still get 250 grand. So that's kind of the the, the the spread to me, 150, 250. Um, but obviously, who, who the hell knows? And as you know, the worst thing for any of us is everybody wants price targets and then a year and a half's time, they hate you for it because you weren't exactly right. I think that's possible. But also think about the crowd that got um, financialized in 2020. Again, mainly the millennial crowd, right? There's 110 million Coinbase accounts and when I checked six months ago, only 9 million were active. So speaking to the guys at Coinbase, they're like, yeah, you know, in normal activity, it'll get to 35, 40 million and the top will grow as well. So there's a lot of money still to come in of people who participated last time around, have that interest, still have PTSD, will come back in. So maybe that offsets it. I don't know. Um, I also have a feeling the applications layer of, of blockchain is going to bring in a lot more use case. So I'm thinking of this cycle as maybe the everything, everywhere, all at one cycle, when people have different unlocks for NFTs or inscriptions or different unlocks for um, smart contracts and some of the other things, and they can use it for everything from whether it's ticketing to real world assets. So. It, it just depends how far that applications layer goes. If the applications layer doesn't make much progress this cycle, then you're dead right. You know, we'll see rebalancing. Don't forget, they're also going to be issuing um, options on the ETF. And that changes the structure of markets as well. Thank you for joining us today on this insightful journey into the world of crypto and investing. 
If you found value in today's discussion and want to stay updated on future crypto news and market insights, don't forget to hit subscribe button below and click the notification bell. By subscribing, you'll be part of our growing community, gaining exclusive access to timely analyses and strategies. I look forward to having you with us in the next video.